Welcome to Half K. My name's Nathan. I first learned about Dan Henry through his website, Timeline.Watch. It's a massive resource for watch enthusiasts, and I think that anybody who's interested in learning more about vintage divers, chronographs, and dress watches is absolutely spoiled to have access to it. So naturally, when I learned that the man behind the website has his own brand of watches, I was intrigued. And when I learned that almost every single one of them is underneath $300, Dan Henry had my attention. I am a massive Formula One fan, and I have been for years. So, of course, the first watch that I'm drawn to is the one that is steeped in motor racing history. The Dan Henry 1962 pays homage to one of the most coveted chronographs in vintage motorsport history, the Universal Genève Compact's reference 885-10302. The Compact is also known as the Nina Rin, named after Miss Nina Rin, the wife of Lotus Formula One driver Joachim Rin, the only man to ever posthumously win the Formula One World Drivers' Championship. The Compact is so closely associated with Miss Rin because during her husband's races, she was very often found wearing the chronograph. Notable elements of the Dan Henry 1962 that most clearly draw inspiration from the compacts are the distinct Universal Genève handset, solid black baton indices, and the K-shape, specifically the twisted lugs. At first glance, some would say that they mirror the lugs of the Omega Speedmaster, but eagle-eyed enthusiasts can see that they really are a closer match than the Nina Rin. This is a really great example of the amount of attention to detail that Mr. Henry paid when he was designing this case. The 1962 also has an element of the Rolex Daytona reference 6239. Piston head markers appear in all three subdials of both chronographs. I'm personally not a big fan of the subdials in this iteration of the Daytona, but that's not because of the markers, but rather the typeface that Rolex opted to use. I'm happy that Dan opted not to use all the elements of the Rolex Daytona subdials, but opted to use a typeface that's a little bit closer to the compacts. Of course, the 1962 is going to be compared to the Rolex Speedmaster, which is probably the most recognizable chronograph still sporting this style of tachometer today. Despite the tachometer ring being a feature that was shared with the compacts, Daytona, and Speedmaster all around that time in the 60s, it was Omega who popularized it with their late 50 Speedmasters, which was originally built for the raceway, but is probably now better known for its historic trips to the moon. Under the hood, the 1962 has a Seiko VK63 Mega Quartz chronograph movement. It's generally a pretty reliable movement, but it does introduce one of my only gripes with the 1962, which is the function of the subdials. The subdial located at 3 o'clock is a 24 hour counter, the 6 o'clock is a 60 second counter, and the 9 o'clock is a 60 minute counter. I find the 24 hour subdial especially redundant, as in practice, I've never found that I have a use for it. At first, I tell myself that Dan had an idea in his mind, that the astronauts who brought the Speedmaster to the moon maybe preferred a 24-hour counter. Maybe they would have preferred this to the Omega Caliber 321, which was in the Speedmasters at that time, which had a 30-minute, a 12-hour, and a 60-second counter at the 3, 6, and 9, respectively. But what do I know? I'm not an astronaut. At the end of the day, this is a pretty small qualm, as the VK63 still does a good job, and Dan could have gone with a simpler, cheaper option. Not that the VK63 is particularly expensive. The 316L stainless steel case measures in about 38 millimeters at its thickest point, but is brought up to 39 millimeters when considering that overhanging tachymeter track. Including the anti-reflection treated double domed K1 mineral glass, the case measures in at about 13 and a half millimeters thick, but in my opinion, it wears a little bit thinner than that figure would suggest. Not everybody is gonna be crazy about that K1 mineral glass, but myself and people smarter than me have paid more for acrylic. So I suppose I can't knock it too hard. After all, K1 is supposedly less likely to scratch than traditional mineral and certainly acrylic. The lug to lug is just under 46 millimeters, giving a really nice compact look, making it suitable for smaller wrists. The lug width is 20 millimeters, which people who love to swap out straps, like myself, are always happy to see. The crown is signed with a DBoss logo against a high mirror polish, the same polish that can be found on just about every other facet of the watch, other than the case back, which is mostly brushed, other than that bead blasted surface enveloping a fantastic embossed depiction of Maserati Tico sporting the number 62 for obvious reasons. The case has about 50 meters of water resistance, which doesn't exactly make it a dive watch, and that reflects with the loom, or lack thereof. There is a little bit of luminova on the hands and the pips above the indices, but I wouldn't exactly count on being able to read this watch without a light source. In terms of customization, there's a total of eight different variables originally available, including four different colors, blue, Gilt, Panda, and Reverse Panda, each with the option of either including or ditching the date window. As you can see, I opted for the Panda model, the model that was most reminiscent of the Nina Rin for going that date window, but the crown still retains that ghost date position. You should probably note that as of the publishing of this episode, the classic Panda variation is completely sold out, both in the date and non-date versions. Yes, these are not limited runs. There's a total of 1,962 pieces available per variation. However, I must admit that I'm not sure if there's a total of 1,962 available per colorway, or per colorway and date window combination, so get them while you can. One interesting note is that the blue date version is only available in the European Union. Returning to the topic of swapping straps, the two straps that are supplied with the watch taper from 20 millimeters at the lug down to 16 millimeters at the clasp. 
I personally don't think that my seven and three quarter inch wrist can really rock that vintage inspired look. So I pretty much immediately slapped a brown leather strap that tapers from 20 millimeter at the lug down to 18 at the clasp. And it makes a huge difference in wrist presence, at least in my mind. To Dan's credit, the black and natural brown French leather strap supplied with the watch really are very nice. The beige stitching is clean and the leather is supple after a little bit of wear in and the sign clasp is always appreciated. Also supplied with the watch is a really nice leather and canvas three pocket watch roll and a one year international warranty. All in all, on paper, this watch really shouldn't be that impressive, especially for as much as a little less than a third of a thousand dollars. Quartz movement, mineral glass, no stainless steel bracelet. However, like so many of the other options out there underneath 500 US dollars, this watch really is worth more than some of its parts. When you're considering the fact that it's very likely one single person or at most a very small team putting this entire operation together from scratch, and when you really take a good look at the history of the watches that inspired this piece, I really think that it more than justifies the $280 price tag. I hope that you found this episode informative, and I hope that you consider the Den Henry 1962 chronograph for your next piece. Thanks for watching.